Good afternoon. It's Wednesday, the 15th of March, 2023, a little bit after one o'clock. Apologies, the Gremlins have been at work in the UK Column studio. Uh, we are delighted to bring you UK Column News. Host today, Mike Robinson, myself, Brian Gerrish. We're joined by David Scott, bringing us northern exposure from north of the border, and uh, Debbie Evans, our very own nursing correspondent. So packed news. As yeah, usual. absolutely. So look, we're going to get str straight on with uh, some news from Germany. And this is the German health minister, uh, Karl uh, Lauterbach. Um, and he's speaking to uh, one of the German, I think it's uh, ZDF, one of the German uh, television channels, about uh, vaccine injuries. I've got a few little clips here. He just starts off, well, just have a listen to this first one and then we'll discuss it. Der Bundesgesundheitsminister ist bei uns. Vielen Dank dafür und guten Abend, Karl Lauterbach. Guten Abend, Herr Sichwas. Was sagen Sie denn diesen Betroffenen? Zunächst einmal, diese Schicksale sind absolut bestürzend und jedes einzelne Schicksal ist eins zu viel. Und äh, die Menschen tun mir ehrlich gesagt auch sehr leid. Das sind schwerste Einschränkungen und davon wird auch einiges permanent sein. Von daher ist das schwierig. Was wir als Staat machen, ist, die Krankenkassen übernehmen halt die Behandlungskosten und also die Länder bezahlen, wenn die Versorgung notwendig ist, die Versorgungskosten. So the state is going to provide ongoing care for the vaccine injured in, German, in Germany and he's clearly, he claims he's extremely upset about what has happened. Uh, to the people involved. He went on to say uh, that at the moment there are no drugs available for dealing with these vaccine injured and the injuries that people have experienced. Uh, but don't worry, uh, because the pharmaceutical companies are developing or they're working at a pace to develop the drugs necessary to solve the problems for those that are injured. Uh, he went on to discuss the numbers. Jetzt tun Sie so ein bisschen so auch, als ob eigentlich alles geregelt wäre. Aber wenn man mit diesen Menschen redet, hört man genau das Gegenteil. Ein Jahr es muss also hier zu einem schnelleren Anerkennen dieser Verfahren, dieser also Impfschäden kommen. Und wir bekommen ja jetzt auch langsam ein klareres Bild. Man muss allerdings auch darauf hinweisen, nur dass kein falscher Eindruck hier hängen bleibt. Schwere Impfschäden sind auf der Grundlage der Daten des Paul-Ehrlich-Institutes oder der Europäischen Zulassungsbehörde in der Größenordnung von weniger als 1 zu 10.000 Impfungen. Somit ist es nicht so, dass das so häufig ist. So he believes that one in 10.000 uh, people that have been given a dose of the jab getting some kind of serious adverse reaction, that that is very rare. Now, uh, as we'll, we'll come on to a, a substack uh, that has been reporting on this in a second, uh, but that substack report makes the point that in Canada, the AstraZeneca vaccine with, was withdrawn on the basis of one in 55,000 adverse reactions. Um, and uh, so is one in 10,000 rare? It doesn't seem very rare to me when we're talking about multiple millions of people uh, being given the jab. Um, so let's move on then with this next point. Warum haben Sie, Herr Lauterbach, im Sommer 2021 noch behauptet, dass die Impfung nebenwirkungsfrei sei? Naja, das war eine Übertreibung, also die ich da einmal in einem missglückten Tweet gemacht habe. Aber es war ja nicht grundsätzlich meine Haltung. Ich hatte ja sehr, sehr häufig vorher auch schon zu den Nebenwirkungen der Impfungen Stellung genommen. Ja, ich hab zum Beispiel sehr Sie viel haben aber die... auch häufig danach noch gesagt, es gebe kaum oder praktisch gar keine, halt mehr oder weniger nebenwirkungsfrei, haben Sie danach in einer Fernsehsendung von Anne Will noch mal gesagt. Also Sie haben schon immer diesen Eindruck erweckt, dass das Thema Nebenwirkungen eigentlich gar kein Thema ist. Na, das ist nicht richtig. Also also, ich habe es ja eben gesagt, also die Zahlen waren mir ja all die Zeit bekannt. Die sind auch relativ stabil geblieben. Diese Impfstoffe sind ja weltweit eingesetzt worden. Eins zu 10.000. Da kann man jetzt sagen, das ist viel. Und man kann sagen, es ist nicht so viel. Aber es ist ja tatsächlich eine Impfung, die vor sehr schwerer Krankheit schützt. So, here we have him again stating the 1 in 10,000 adverse reactions figure and very much trying to walk back from the position that he clearly, the, 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 journal, the journalist that's interviewing them, they're absolutely challenging him on the fact that in the past he said no adverse reactions or no side effects, the, the vaccines are safe, go ahead and take them. Uh, and uh, so he's getting a bit of a pushback uh, there. Uh, let's listen to the next little bit. 
stehen die ersten Klagen an, gegen BioNTech, auch gegen andere Impfstoffhersteller. Was glauben Sie, wie die ausgehen werden? Ich kann nicht spekulieren, das ist nicht meine Aufgabe. Als Minister muss ich also da vorsichtig sein. Richtig ist, dass also im Rahmen dieser EU-Verträge damals die äh, Unternehmen weitestgehend aus der Haftung äh, befreit worden sind und dass daher die Haftung also beim, beim deutschen Staat liegt, also quasi bei, wie eben beschrieben bei den Ländern, aber wie, äh, Krankenkassen. So, because of EU rules, uh, the uh, vaccine companies, the pharma companies, uh, not subject to any liability. The liability falls on the state uh, if there's a and there is an ongoing court case. Uh, against BioNTech at the moment, uh, which will be heard in Germany in April, at least the, the initial stages of it will be heard in Germany in April, um, then uh, the German state, should there be any damages awarded, the German state will be required to pay that. In other words, the German taxpayer. So the German taxpayer who's been on the receiving end of the jabs and the adverse reactions to the jabs, the same German taxpayer that has provided the bio, uh, Pfizer and BioNTech and these types of companies with all the multi billions of profits that they've had will have to then pay for the liabilities uh, as a result of any court case that comes out. We've got one final uh, clip here. Jetzt haben Sie gerade diesen Haftungsausschluss selbst angesprochen. Der führt ja dazu, dass die Pharmafirmen in all diesen Gerichtsverfahren sich quasi zurücklehnen können, weil nämlich der Staat das Risiko übernommen hat. Die, der muss dann, also Sie, die Bundesregierung, für solche Schadensersatzforderungen, die sich möglicherweise ergeben, gerade stehen. Ist das ein gutes Gefühl, das Sie damit haben? Was heißt ein gutes Gefühl? Zunächst einmal, ich habe die Verträge damals nicht gemacht, äh, sondern bin in diese Verträge, äh, was mein Amt angeht, hineingewachsen. Und äh, ich glaube, dass es der damaligen Situation geschuldet ist, dass man damals so schnell wie möglich die Impfstoffe nutzen wollte. Und da ist der Staat also in die Haftung gegangen. Vielleicht war das auch richtig, denn es ist besser, dass der Staat also haftet, als wenn mit Firmen lange dann Vergleiche oder Prozesse geführt werden müssen. So it's better for the state to take on the liability rather than to get tangled up in the weeds of trying to deal with multi-billion uh, euro corporations and so on. Now, before I get comment from everybody else, I just want to make this point. This was the German health minister speaking. This is not uh, a commentator or uh, even even a doctor that was, uh, you know, in some way opposed to the idea of vaccination. This is a German health minister. Uh, therefore, politicians in this country cannot ignore these comments. And so I would suggest that uh, what everybody needs to do at this point is to take that video clip and absolutely challenge their MPs about it. Christopher Chope basically it seems a lone voice in the uh, House of Commons trying to uh, get some action on adverse reactions in this country uh, in the face of 640 or 645 other MPs that are uh, absolutely against him on this. So uh, I think uh, there needs to be some major pressure placed on MPs and this, I believe, would give the, uh, the pressure that, that uh, could be brought. It's necessary, yes. yeah. Well, I, I, I'll just comment fascinating to watch him flipping and flopping from side to side and, and trying to say, you know, not on my shoulders. So under immense pressure there. But think about, I can't remember the exact sum, think about the pitiful sums that the UK government is offering vaccine damaged people at the moment in UK and think about the stress of applications for people who need uh, support funding because they've been so heavily damaged. And I'd also like to say if that's comment by the Germans, it was the UK column that uh, way back did an interview with uh, Professor um, Christian Perron, who was in his former years head of the French vaccination service. And he, dis he um, described what was happening with the whole of the vaccination, COVID-19 vaccination policy as sheer madness. Uh, a man who was later vilified, although I understand his position in France has now recovered. And just anecdotally, Mike, by coincidence, I was talking to a local councillor on the telephone yesterday who uh, told me about the number of people he knew who had uh, either suffered serious injury following a vaccination or were dead. 
and uh, he was talking about four or five individuals and he said said to me there are more uh, indeed uh, so i'd like to get uh, the thoughts of debbie and david here debbie what what did you make of that oh well um there was a couple of points i'd like to mention quickly uh, number one he was uh, he called it a vaccination and uh, i would challenge that uh, i call it an injection um he also said that he wasn't sure whether one in ten thousand was uh, whether that you would consider that a lot well i can tell you as we go on in the news, um, it's one of those stories, you know, where they can't have it both ways. Because I can show where a one in 10,000 risk has effectively led to the removal of an over-the-counter prescription medicine in the last couple of days. So if it's severe enough to do that, then I would suggest to him that it's extremely severe. Um, also, Pfizer are very busy. We're going to come on to that later. So we'll see what Pfizer are up to because BioNTech and Pfizer are both splashing the cash. So um, I think also, actually, one more thing, and I will slip this in quickly because I'm afraid I haven't been able to bring it to the, the main news today, but I promise you we will talk about it in extra. Dr. Christian Buckland has just brought my attention to an MHRA. Um, it, it's a, a committee, a select committee, referring to an investigation that is about to take place with the MHRA, highlighting many of the comments there that that German health minister made. So perhaps we can discuss that in extra. And I'm sorry it was brought too late to me to include it in today's news. But it is a very, very big news. Thanks, Debbie. Uh, David? I'm fascinated with the figures. And, and I hope we can we can uh, dig into them with the, with the German ministry a little more. One in 10,000, that seemed to be one in 10,000 per vaccination, as far as I could tell from that clip. And of course, you, you've got two shots initially and then one, two, three boosters. So does that mean that in terms of human beings, it's one in two and a half thousand or one in 2,000? Mm -hmm. um, so that's one question. Secondly, he admitted essentially that the, the, the process of identifying vaccine adverse reactions is not very good. They're not very, they're not very quick at recognizing when this happens. So how many are being missed? Uh, again, how how reliable is the one in 10,000 figure? Um, and one in 10,000, just to put that in context, in other areas of, of, of uh, dealing with risk in engineering, which is which is my own line, um, one in a million, a risk of one in a million per year is considered small enough to be ignored because that's the risk that you run essentially driving to work in the morning. A risk of one in a thousand per year is so high that basically you have to stop whatever you're doing and eliminate that. That's, that's, that's sort of crisis time. And in between those two figures, which is where we are, um, you have to do everything you can, everything that's reasonably possible to reduce the risk. That's the legal requirement. So if we're talking about something of one in 10,000, there is, a, there is a, a legal requirement, health and safety law, for example, to, to reduce that risk to as low as is reasonably practicable. The, the, this is not something where it can just be dismissed, oh, it's one in 10,000. Um, that's a figure where action is absolutely required um, by, by, by law now stretching back to the 1970s, that that level of risk is unacceptable. And one other thing about the figures, we have a huge amount of excess death. Germany, Europe, Britain, America, all across the Western world, total, total all-cause mortality is up. And we don't know why. We're told it's a mystery. You know, it might be the snowing or, you know, people are being too fat or they're not taking enough exercise or they're taking too much exercise. It's, it's, but it's not the vaccines because that's a conspiracy theory. Well, we don't know anything of the sort. Now, if we have this huge amount of excess mortality, which is not being attributed to the effect of the vaccines, if, for example, a substantial part of that is due to the vaccines, what does that do to the one in 10,000 figure? Uh, I mean, I think it's already vastly concerning. It shows that the we recognise that the technical case for the COVID policies fell apart oh, 18 months ago, and we've been reporting on this, but it's it fell apart 
at a level of the intellectual argument, of the technical argument, the, the state's position was gone, but it hadn't been recognised in uh, the corridors of power or in the mainstream media. And here we have um, the health minister of Germany basically admitting the game's up. It's an astonishing piece of video, and you're quite right, Mike, about its significance. And uh, David, I'd, I'd just add, it comes into my mind that, of course, it's only been in the last few months that the uh, MHRA has stalled, I'll use that uh, description, has stalled its production of the yellow card data. So the impression I get from, from that is that the MHRA is dragging their own statistics about vaccine damage into the long grass in the hope that people can't see it. Okay, well, look, here is that Substack uh, report uh, COVID, from the COVID Chronicles. Substack bombshell from Germany's Federal Minister for Health uh, admits their severe COVID-19 vaccine injuries have always exceeded what Canada deemed to be program ending. Um, so uh, the, full, the full ZDF uh, report is there because that interview only occupied a part of, of the ZDF report. Um, and uh, so I do recommend that people go and watch the whole thing with subtitles on YouTube. There's a link to it there. Um, and uh, what I would just end by saying is, where's the BBC? Because uh, the, the German media seem to be cottoning on to this. But in this country, silence. Yeah, as normal. Um, so Debbie, junior doctors, yeah, junior doctors, we're now on day three of the junior doctors strike um, and they're asking for a 35 percent pay increase uh, to make up for inflation for the past 15 years, which has cut their earnings apparently to 26 percent. Um, I'm sad. I see banners there, £14 an hour, and there was an article in the paper to suggest that some prêt-à-manger workers were in receipt of more than £14 an hour. Um, I'm just sorry that there aren't any banners there that um, reflect the um, serious adverse reactions or the yellow cards. However, it, it, should we be relying on junior doctors right now? Because there are some very alarming reports coming out, no more, no more so than this one, which is saying that um, NHS junior doctors are suffering from panic attacks and feelings of desperation. Now, this is a new uh, research study that's come out that The Guardian have focused. And if anybody wants to go and look at the uh, research study. The next slide will show you it's from Leeds University Business School uh, from Sanjay Popper entitled Two Months in the Life of a Junior Doctor. So many of our doctors are reporting mental health crises and issues. Um, they're not sleeping. Um, and you know, have to ask yourself the question, are these, are these doctors well enough to be looking after us? And I've personally experienced uh, a very senior NHS consultant um, looking very worried um, and actually he was vocalizing his concerns about the NHS to us um, in, in an appointment so we can see that doctors uh, are very upset and are very stressed however on the flip side of this strike, the Telegraph has brought out an interesting story to say that actually the NHS at the moment couldn't be in safer hands because, of course, the junior doctors, the ones that are all stressed, the ones that are suffering with mental health conditions, the ones that can't cope and the ones that want more pay, um, they're not there. So we've got 17,000 um, consultants running the NHS at the moment but could the junior doctors be the turkeys at Christmas because it would appear that if the NHS is safer without them then possibly we'd be better run with consultants but let's not forget the consultants want a pay rise too so now the consultants are threatening to go out on strike so they've been balloted so who knows consultants next. The Mirror's um, reporting this. More than 17,000 NHS consultants um, could vote to strike in a ballot next month. So who knows what might happen um, with the junior doctors and um, the consultants. We could end up with an NHS with no doctors at all uh, because probably they're too all they're too ill. Did you have any comments there, gentlemen? Before yeah, well, I move Debbie, on I, did, to... I did have I did have one thing on my mind. I mean, uh, a lot of the media coverage of this uh, has focused on uh, NHS doctor salaries, and and of course, if you look at even a junior doctor's salary, it seems quite reasonable on the face of it. But what most people 
forget, and this has been an issue that has been going on for many, many years, is that junior doctors are routinely working 100 hour weeks. Uh, and so when you actually take their, you take their, their annual salary and, and divide that by 100 hour weeks, uh, you end up with quite a low hourly rate. Uh, and you know they they are they've been under stress for a very long time is the point I'm trying to make. Yeah, and let's not forget that junior doctors make up forty percent of the NHS workforce, and junior doctors are all doctors below consultant level, and GPs are regarded as consultants. They are a consultant level in their own right. So yes, you're absolutely right. And of course, conditions, we don't look after our doctors, we don't look after our nurses anymore. And I've talked about that in my blog, and I'm sure we'll talk about it again. In the meantime, we've still got problems with ambulances where a quarter of ambulance staff are threatening to quit now um, because they've that 50% of them have witnessed deaths from NHS delays. So let's not forget the ambulances because they've been kind of quietly swept under the carpet. If it's not one strike, it's another strike. As we were warning as well and have been warning on the news, prescription charges will now be increasing to £9.65 from next month. Now, this is an increase of 30 pence. Um, this is per item, and it's a significant increase. And my prediction is that the next move by stealth will be to in in increase the age uh, to 66, because currently over 60s don't pay for prescription charges, but I think they might hike that up to in line with um, the pension age now. Now, the next story is is actually ties in very nicely with your first um, observation, Mike, of the German minister. Uh, those of you that have been watching the news will see that Volkadine, any preparation now, cough, this is a cough suppressant, um, any medication with Volkadine has been withdrawn from over-the-counter use. So this is a very interesting story. I'll just pop you on to the Government UK um, advice for patients because I feel that we have to do that. Folkadine um, is in many medications and I'll show you the medications in a minute but apparently if you are going to have an operation with a general anaesthetic which as I understand it would include something that would be used as a muscle par paralysis agent then apparently this could lead to anaphylaxis shock. Now <laughs> This is a one in 10,000 risk, right? So it's a tiny, tiny risk. Who is going to know, who remembers in the last year, have you had a product with Volcadine in it? Probably most people, most people we know don't check the patient safety leaflets and we'll come on to that in a minute. But what they're saying is if you've had Volcadine for 12 months prior to a general anesthetic, and you don't know what's going to be used in that general anaesthetic. You might just have sedation. It might be a lighter anaesthetic. This is for anaesthesia that has been using muscle relaxants. So the, all of these medications have now gone off offline. Now, I'm just taking this article um, as an example. We can go and have a look at most of them online now have got um, the products. So this is just the one that I was using. So let's have a little look at the product which items are affected by the recall everybody's jumping up and down and saying oh my goodness this is Cavonia uh, we've used that for ages this is day and night nurse but look very closely there because we're looking at Folkadine right and a little while ago we were talking about neuroephedrine which was linked to um, a very rare brain disorder. So this is completely different. This is Folkadine. Now, if you look down right at the bottom, it says day and night nurse capsules, right? Day nurse capsules, day nurse PL. It doesn't say anything about, because everybody's going, oh, night nurse. Now, I've got a bottle of night nurse right here in front of me, right there, night nurse. Now, if you go and look at the this is the elixir. So this is the, the medicine, okay? This isn't tablets. So if you look at the patient information leaflet here, so just, if there are any pharmacists out there watching, please correct me if I'm wrong. But according to this, the active ingredients of the liquid night nurse, which many people are saying is now gone, the, uh, the ingredients are paracetamol. So you obviously you should never take 
uh, any paracetamol if you're going to take something like this because you'll overdose. So please check the ingredients. It's also got promethazine in it. Now, promethazine, some people might have heard of promethazine as phenagon, which is an antihistamine, um, antiemetic, stops you feeling sick and can be a bit of a sedative. And it's also got dextromethorphan hydrobamide. I'm sorry about the pronunciation. Now that I believe is a cough suppressant, which is different from folcadine. There is no inclusion of folcadine in the patient information leaflet. So if anybody is going to go to the pharmacy to get night nurse, as in this night nurse, sorry, can you see it there? Um, which is the liquid, and you're told you can't have it, perhaps check with the pharmacist, because as I'm seeing it, and I'm sure that David or one of you gentlemen will be checking checking me out as I'm, I'm saying it, but as I'm understanding it, this night nurse does not have folcadine in it. So there you go. Um, that's an exclusive for you. Um, we'll go on now to a very quickly excess mortality, and we've got a, a a story from The Guardian, which says that the NHS crisis is causing continued higher than normal levels of death. Now, can I just highlight this article is dated March 2023, but they're going on data that was between June and October 2022. So I've been looking at James Roguski's sub, sub stack and you know that we've been interviewing James Roguski with regards to the WHO guidelines, the international health regulations, and also Mark Anderson's been doing a phenomenal job with, with keeping, keeping us all up to date on the WHO. But James has put this very interesting substack out. And I might have to ask you, um, Mike, if you wouldn't mind uh, reading that what I've underlined in red, please. It's a bit uh, small for me. Thank well, you. Well, it says at the beginning, I'd like to encourage people around the world to submit freedom of information requests to obtain the data that their nations have been obligated to report to the World Health Organization according to the international health regulations. And it's talking about Annex 1, uh, a core capacity requirement for surveillance and response uh, to detect events involving disease or death uh, above expected levels for the particular time and place uh, in all areas within the territory of the state party uh, and to report all available uh, essential information immediately to the appropriate level of healthcare response. Uh, for the purposes of this annex, essential information includes the following clinical descriptions, laboratory results, sources and types of risk, numbers of human cases and deaths, conditions affecting the speed of the disease, and, uh, sorry, the spread of the disease and the health measures employed, and to implement preliminary control measures immediately. Yes, so this is from the WHO, and it says that this is their core capacity response requirement. So basically, we have a value in death, and excess mortality is of great interest to the WHO. It means basically that each country has to report excess mortalities and the reasons for, for excess mortalities to the WHO. What James has highlighted is that each country has a different spike on when we've had excess mortalities. It's very, um, very important that if you're watching from another country, check your own country, because what we're seeing now is why are we seeing at what times? Each country's had a different spike at a different time for a different reason. But if the WHO are insisting and making it a condition that every country reports excess mortality, what kind of data are they getting that? And who's in whose best interests is it to keep excess mortality high, I think is what we're seeing. And I just want to show you what the most recent data is with regarding to excess mortality, bearing in mind that that um, slide uh, from the article was for June 2022. So I found a recent um, from the actuaries, um, the Institute Faculty of Actuaries, the Continuous Mortality Investigation. Now, I never knew that this existed, and I'd be very grateful at some point, maybe if Mike can have a little look at more of it, because I'm not very good at data crunching. But it would appear from this report, and this is this week, this is the latest report, that excess mortality is seen to be dipping a little bit there. But I, I could be reading it wrong. So I just wanted to flag that up, that the WHO have a, con a concerted interest into excess mortality data. 
So even in death, we are worth a lot of money. And we're being watched in death. Even when, we die, when we've died, the surveillance is still there. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Debbie, for that. Uh, David, uh, let's move back to economy then. And uh, well, if the continuing banking travails, shall we say. Uh, Joe Biden made a comment about the, uh, the uh, recent banking collapses, the two banks in, in the United States. Uh, what do, you, do you want to yeah. introduce this little well, video to, clip? To, yes, to restore confidence across the whole nation. Who else are you going to call on but President Joe Biden? So he came out and this is what he said. Before I uh, leave for California, I want to briefly speak about what's happening in Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. Today, thanks to the quick action of my administration over the past few days, Americans can have confidence that the banking system is safe. Your deposits will be there when you need them. Small businesses across the country, the deposit accounts at these banks can breathe easier knowing they'll be able to pay their workers and pay their bills. And their hardworking employees can breathe easier as well. Last week, when we learned of the problems of the banks and the impact they could have on jobs of small businesses and banking system overall, I instructed my team to act quickly to protect these interests. They've done that. They've done that. On Friday, the government regulator in charge, the FDIC, took control of Silicon Valley Bank's assets. And over the weekend, it took control of Signature Bank's assets. Treasury Secretary Yellen and the team of banking regulators have taken action, immediate action. And here are the highlights. First, all customers who had deposits in these banks can rest assured, I want to have, rest assured they'll be protected and they'll have access to their money as of today. That includes small businesses across the country that bank there and need to make payroll, pay their bills and stay open for business. No losses, will, and I want, this is an important point, no losses will be borne by the taxpayers. Let me repeat that. No losses will be borne by the taxpayers. Instead, the money will come from the fees that banks pay into the deposit insurance fund. Because of the actions of that, because of the actions that our regulator has already taken, every American should feel confident that their deposits will be there if and when they need them. Second, the management of these banks will be fired. If the bank is taken over by FDIC, the people running the bank should not work there anymore. Third, investors in the banks will not be protected. They knowingly took a risk, and when the risk didn't pay off, investors lose their money. That's how capitalism works. And fourth, there are important questions of how these banks got into the circumstance in the first place. We must get the full accounting of what happened and why those responsible can be held accountable. In my administration, no one, in my no one is above the law. Right. Apart from stumbling over the line, no one is above the law, which I thought was quite interesting. There's a few other things in there. Um, he's basically said that only quick action by the government saved the banks. I thought that was essential. The banks are safe because of the rapid uh, response by his administration, not because the banks are sound. So I thought that was quite interesting. Um, next thing he said, all deposits are protected. Now, the, the, the deposit protection scheme was for the first $250,000. And in the particular case of um, uh, the, uh, the bank that failed, that was only a few percent of the deposits. Almost all of the deposits, 96% or something, wasn't covered by the deposit protection scheme. So what they've done is they've, they've extended the deposit protection scheme massively to cover everything. Now, the deposit protection scheme only has assets to cover a tiny fraction of the insured funds across the banking system. So they've taken something which was already extremely thinly spread and they've spread it much, much wider. But this is this is meant to restore confidence. I'm not sure that it will. Um, he talks about uh, it's all going to be paid for by the banks. Well, actually, by the bank depositors, because it's, it's, that's where the money comes from. And then he says, uh, investors are not protected. That's how capitalism works. Actually, technically, if you 
deposit money in a bank, you are lending your money to the bank and you're an unsecured, um, you're an unsecured lender, I'm afraid. So um, when when Biden starts talking about that's that's how capitalism works and it's targeting somebody else, doesn't necessarily stop there. Um, so overall, I thought this was uh, it, it essentially a move to, to, to bail out failing institutions, um, to shore up uh, and, 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 and attempt to restore confidence in the banking system because confidence had actually plummeted. It was looking pretty dark when he came out to make that statement. Um, and, and overall, I thought a less than convincing performance and one which, which, which cuts across other elements of the, of the American state and what they are doing, um, he's basically saying to the voters, everything's OK, you don't have anything to fear. Um, meanwhile, the banking system crisis hasn't been resolved. Uh, that what do is you think, in, gentlemen? Uh, that is indeed the case. And I just want to highlight one point. At the end of that, is, no matter what you might think about the rest of the speech, but the last sentence about no one being above the law, that's a simple lie. That is a simple lie because uh, he is breaking the law. Let's put the law on screen. Here's the... Uh, FDIC law, regulations related acts, section 11. Let's get the quote. The net amount of insured deposit, the net amount due to any depositor at an insured depository institution shall not exceed the standard maximum deposit insurance amount as determined in accordance with subparagraph C, D, E, F and paragraph 3. And that figure, David, is $250,000. There is no scope for changing $250,000 other than for minor adjustments as a result of inflation. It does not say that it is legal. In fact, it quite clearly says it's illegal to simply open the taps and bail out the banks to whatever figure you happen to choose. So for Biden to simply say at the end of his uh, comment there that no one is above the law, not only is it a lie, but he really needs to reconsider his own position. That's a very good point. And of course, why are they doing this is because there was panic, right? There was a serious threat here, and they're trying. They're trying to do the confidence trick. The, the Irish government did this some years ago. Uh, they announced, somewhat smugly, that they just organised the cheapest bailout in banking history because they they'd said that the Irish government stand behind the Irish banks, and and that restored confidence. And the confidence restored the integrity of the banks. So everything was OK. And it didn't cost a penny. Well, and then all of a sudden it did cost a penny because the real problems in the banks were still there. And only now the, in this case, the Irish taxpayer was on the hook. And the Irish taxpayer was fleeced. Uh, the country was put into horrendous debt in order to bail out its banking system. Now, they're saying it's not going to be um, the the taxpayer, but the the insurance scheme which they are claiming is covering all of this cannot cover uh, much more than the banks that have already gone down, uh, and the next the next recourse is to the treasury. That scheme has recourse to the United States Treasury. So to say, uh, well, it's, it's, there's no taxpayers' money going on this. It leaves out the key word, yet. Yeah. Uh, and then the other question I had in my mind, as it was, uh, I didn't mention this on Monday, but of course, uh, uh, Silicon Valley Bank was employing somebody by the name of Lehman. Uh, well, apparently the mail has picked this one up. Uh, so let's bring this on screen. Former Lehman Brothers CFO was hired by SVB and recently appointed risk manager. I mean, I mean, who would, I mean, would you employ? But yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yes, my, my, yes. You, you would employ. Well, this is, yeah. this, if, I, if I may, David, just uh, I think this is a key thing. Uh, in the earlier bit of the segment, um, regulators were mentioned. Well, of course, the regulators are absolutely in bed. They are inherent part of the banking system itself. So this is supposedly a self-policing organisation. We can see what is clearly negligent and or criminal activity but when we look for who the policemen are going to be we find that it's the same people yes yeah, so this is this parallels is really, with the well, farmer isn't it? it it parallels with the farm, farm uh, big farmer industry it's, it, it's very it, it's very similar to big farmer you're quite right but it's actually worse than you just stated there so we've got this chap here who 
Um, his name, jo uh, Joseph Gentile. Um, and uh, yeah, he was chief financial officer at Lehman up to one year before Lehman collapsed. So when all the mistakes were made, he was chief financial officer. And he went on to become chief administrative officer at Silicon Valley Bank. And well, we know how that worked out. Uh, they also say that they, they had a long time without a risk manager during the point where all the risk was was, uh, was cranking up. And they, they then got a risk manager from Deutsche Bank, which has got a bit of a, a, a troubled uh, past as well. Um, but the point you made there, Brian, about, about who regulates them, well, of course, this is part of the Federal Reserve System. And it was the, the local Federal Reserve Bank that was the regulator for uh, Silicon Valley Bank. And on the board of that um, of that Federal Reserve Bank was the chief, e chief executive of Silicon Valley Bank. He was essentially checking his own homework. Yes. Uh, where does that take us? Uh, Financial Times here, banks are designed to fail. Now, this is actually, I, I do suggest people uh, search this one out because it's actually a very good article. There's a part two to come next week We'll see if that's as good. But this is uh, Martin Wolf writing. He said, he said, banks fail. When they do, those who stand to lose scream for state rescue. Um, and if the threat and costs are big enough, they will succeed. This is how crisis after crisis, we've created a banking sector that's in theory private, but in practice a ward of the state. I think that's a very good way of putting it. Uh, the latter in turn attempts to curb the desire of shareholders' management to exploit the safety nets they enjoy. The result is a system that is essential to the function of the market economy, but does not operate within its rules. This is a mess. This is a very good summary. So he continues on here. He said, banks are not designed to be secure. Their uh, deposit liabilities are supposed to be perfectly safe and liquid, um, and their assets are subject to maturity, credit, interest rate, liquidity risks. They are fair weather institutions. In bad times, they fail, and depositors run for the door. Again, a very good su a summary of what a bank is. Uh, so over time, over time state, the state institutions has responded to the inability of banks to provide safe money the depositors expect. So you had the 19th century central banks came up, came along to be lenders of last resort. Um, in the early 20th century, uh, governments guaranteed the smaller deposits. Then in the financial crisis of uh, 07, 09, they basically put the entire balance sheet of the government behind the banks. The banking system as a whole became part of the state. And in return, capital requirements were raised. Liquidity rules were tightened and the stress tests were introduced. And did this work? Well, no. Now, we've got a graph here that shows just how bad things actually are, because this is all about the quality of the assets the banks are holding. Not only are these assets illiquid, you know, they can't easily sell them and you've got a demand deposit and you can, you can go down to your bank and demand the money at any time. But the value of these, um, these securities, things like government debt, is falling. As interest rates go up, the value of the bonds already issued falls. And you see here just how much the unrealized losses on these banks' balance sheets are. So obviously SVB was basically wiped out by this. But all of the banks are, are hugely uh, affected. If you take, uh, say, US Bancor down the, down the bottom there, they've got, in theory, 8% um, equity to tier one capital ratio. So they, they, they've got 8% 8, 8 of the, the what's on their balance sheet they have in actual equity within the bank. But actually, it's more like 4%. So this means that all of the banks are much more vulnerable than, than they claim to be uh, because of the falling value of the assets that they hold. Um, and then the next chart shows just how bad this is. Now, remember, the Federal Reserve has basically said that they will take these assets in and they will lend on them at par. So they're, they're underwriting. They're essentially offering to put this loss on the Federal Reserve Bank's balance sheet for a year. And how much are we talking about? Well, this is not current. This is at the end of December. Right now, it's probably a lot worse. But the unrealized losses in the banking system in the States is round about 600 to 700 billion dollars, which in anyone's uh, world is a lot of money. So this, uh, this article uh, concludes, the fundamental lesson we have to learn is that even in a modest crisis, deposits cannot be sacrificed. Rules on haircuts 
for provision of liquidity will go out the window. Banks are wards of the state, partly because they're at the heart of the credit system, but even more because their deposit liabilities are so politically important. That's the key point. He said the marriage of risky and illiquid assets with liabilities that have to be safe and liquid uh, within undercapitalized, profit-seeking, bonus-paying institutions regulated by politically subservient and often incompetent public sectors is a calamity waiting to happen. Banking needs radical change. Now, I thought that was a wonderful summary of just what the situation is. Part two next week will apparently say what he thinks the change should be. So we'll see what we think of that. Uh, but in the meantime, I mean, uh, there's there's some a couple of points I want to make about that, but we'll keep that for extra. In the meantime, uh, in Switzerland, Credit Suisse is, uh, well, also in trouble. So it's not just the United States banks. <laughs> no, you can't make it up. So Credit Suisse, right? This, this is Swiss. Well, this is allegedly Swiss banking, although they're now international. They're not quite as Swiss anymore. Um, They've got a problem because they've got material weaknesses in their financial reporting mechanisms and they're not able to accurately report about their financial condition. Um, the bank admitted they were going to have to dedicate significant resources to fixing its financial reporting. And this could prevent the bank from providing reliable financial information to investors. How, 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 how much worse could it possibly be? Um, the Times continues, the warning comes after Credit Suisse reported its biggest annual loss since the 2008 financial crisis um, and has and said it would suffer another substantial loss in 2023. That loss, incidentally, was £1.24 billion in the fourth quarter of last year alone. So Credit, Credit Suisse not looking good. And really what they're saying is they don't actually know. They can't be sure how bad it is. Uh, indeed, but then it's hardly surprising because central banks, the Bank of England in particular, don't have a clue what's going on either. I watch. I did this so you don't have to, viewers. I watched the Bank of England uh, press conference as they announced their February uh, monetary report, and and I had to sat sat there and watch this strange performance where apparently. The Bank of England, who'd created the inflation by creating all of the money when the, when, the, when we shut down the economy during COVID, apparently they'd no idea this had anything to do with it. And they were talking about inflation as though it's something just to do with supply and demand and prices. It's like, it's like they don't know what the words mean. Now, I don't believe, I, we've talked about whether they're incompetent or not, I don't believe they're that incompetent. That's simply pulling the wool over the eyes of the public. The BBC were there to have the wool pulled and uh, were completely impervious to what was going on. They were saying, essentially, um, inflation has come down a tiny tick, still over 10%, but that shows we've turned the corner, everything's going to be fine. Not to worry our pretty heads. And when you look at the prediction, well, inflation's going to plummet down to, oh well, almost nothing uh, very quickly. So in, they're, they're, they're telling us inflation is completely beaten. Like, there's still risks, right? They're, they're couching it in terms where, you know, they can get out if it doesn't work out. They can they can say, well, we kind of warned you because that's the way these 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 reports are written. They're always they always give themselves outs. But they're basically saying inflation's licked. Don't worry about it. Now, I don't believe that because the money creation was so egregious, and that's what inflation actually is, it's expansion of the money supply. That's the thing that they were not talking about in their press conference, and the BBC were kind enough not to ask them. Uh, and it hasn't stopped. Yeah, just, just one question, David. Was he speaking for the Bank of England, or was he actually speaking for the Bank of International Settlements? Because, of course, that gentleman steps seam seamlessly between the Bank of England and the Bank of International Settlements. And yet the Bank of International Settlements activities in the UK are beyond the gaze of the UK public. Who was he working well, for? Well, he's speaking for the Bank of England. He, he was speaking for the Bank of England and he was speaking in this kind of strange grey world between public and private, just as the Fed operates in this. Is it public? Is, is it private? How, and if it's public, can we know about it? Well, not really, because it's all confidential. And we have this very woolly system where accountability, responsibility um, doesn't seem to happen. And then when things go badly wrong, it's always the same course. It's always money printing. So that you have 
stealing, stealing wealth from the people by stealth, by inflation, and taxation, um, stealing uh, wealth from the people by more, more direct and obvious means. It's either the taxpayer or it's inflation, because those are the only two tools they've got in the end of the day. OK, thank you very much for that. Well, uh, let's move on to one of the bankers' other favourites, which is war, of course. So uh, let's give you an update on uh, Ukraine. And as always, I want to thank all of the alternative media sites out there, uh, both ones that may be considered to be biased towards Russia, but also ones that are clearly uh, uh, biased towards Ukraine. It's only by having a look at the work of these uh, individuals that we can start to get some detailed reporting on the battlefield because of course we know that our very own uh, media in UK and certainly the Ministry of Defence with Defence Intelligence are not telling the public the truth. But on Monday we uh, reported this story. It was about a deep underground bunker being hit and the report that was circulating was that a significant number of NATO personnel who were there advising Ukraine had died. Um, we put a little red sticker on it saying NATO sent a hit question mark because uh, we knew there was a little bit of uncertainty. We just want to say today that it's still not obvious what happened or indeed if something did happen with that particular centre. So we don't know. Uh, but what we can be certain of is that the Russians are working extremely hard to identify and destroy command and control facilities, particularly where they include NATO employees, because of course NATO is providing the bulk of this essential war fighting function. Um, let's give you a little sort of round, round up, and I've used a number of sources. I will try and move it over, move it around over the coming days and weeks so that it's, it's fair. But uh, this is just outside Bakhmut, uh, appalling conditions on the one a uh, very difficult road the Ukrainians have got left to get gear out. They're being shelled by the Russians. Uh, and this picture is showing a column that's been hit. Um, I think the vehicle on the left of your screen is an American Hummer. We're now seeing more and more Western equipment destroyed on the battlefield. And what's happening, of course, this is a war of drones. And in this uh, picture, we've got a uh, a Russian drone that has picked up an M77 howitzer tucked away in one of the wooded areas on the edge of the field. This is how the warfare is being conducted. Every hedgerow has largely been fortified by the Ukrainians and the Russians are using uh, drones in order to take out equipment. And this is continuing on an hour by hour, uh, day by day, week by week, week basis, which is causing significant losses. This is the other problem that uh, at the moment it's still very wet in Ukraine and roads uh, are many roads if they're not metalled are completely impassable. So we've got another M777 howitzer stuck in the mud here. There's a tank which does manage to pull it out but this shows the pitiful state of many of the uh, um, many of the Ukrainian battalions where they are having great difficulty even coping with the conditions, let alone fight the Russians with no ammunition. And what does the battlefield look like? Well, I've just chosen a couple of pictures here. This is actually from Mariinka, um, but this is, uh, if you like, in suburban area where you're not amongst all the high, the, uh, high rise buildings, uh, more minor buildings, very difficult to fortify and Ukrainians are dying in very large numbers, being told to defend areas which are essentially not defendable. So top left, you can see that there were some higher rise buildings. These have been heavily targeted. Um, but the damage in front of you can only be achieved with massive amounts of shells. And the story in the West that the Russians are running out of shells is clearly complete nonsense. This is Bakhmud, which is now getting worse and worse. Uh, the Russians have moved into the metal factory to the north of the city with a red arrow. And they're also moving further into the city itself with pretty appalling losses to the Ukrainian forces. Um, this uh, just shows you the extent of the attack on the metal works, which was known to be a heavily uh, defended position by the Ukrainian forces. It has extensive underground facilities. And unlike Mariupol, 
and the steel works where the Russians didn't, excuse me, didn't go underground. They have de deliberately gone underground early in order to uh, weed out the Ukrainian defenders. So brutal fighting and, of course, men suffering on both sides of this battle. But here's where we start to get the truth. Don't look to the BBC, but we're getting some facts which people should pay attention. We're back to the Kiev Independent. Uh, this is actually from March the 5th, so it's a few days ago. But the headline is Ukrainian soldiers in Bakhmut, our troops are not being protected. It talks about a couple of uh, Ukrainian infantrymen. Uh, they told the Kiev Independent of unprepared, poorly trained battalions thrown into the frontline meat grinder to survive as best they could with, quote, little support from armoured vehicles, mortars, artillery, drones and tactical information. We don't get any support, said one of the soldiers uh, who's been fighting on the front line. And uh, if we follow it through, they say that Russian artillery, infantry, fighting vehicles and armoured personnel carriers are often allowed to, quote, strike Ukrainian positions for hours or days without being shut down by Ukrainian heavy weapons. Some complained of poor coordination and situational awareness, allowing this to happen or make it even worse. But there we're seeing again the Ukrainian troops talking about unlimited weapons on the or ammunition on the, the uh, Russian side. And uh, here we have further comment about the state of the Ukrainian military. Mortarmen spoke of extreme ammunition scarcity and having to use weapons dated back to World War II. Drones that are supposed to provide critical, critical reconnaissance information are also scare, scarce and are being lost at very high rates. All this leads to terrifying casualties of both dead and wounded. Uh, we have another quote, the battalion came in the middle of December. Between all the different platoons, there were 500 of us. Uh, a combat medic says a month ago, there were literally 150 of us. When you go out to the position, it's not even a 50-50 chance you'll come out of there alive. It's more like 30-70. So that is the brutal reality of what's happening in Bakhmud. Let's have a look at uh, what uh, Mr. Stoltenberg had to say when he was questioned in front of cameras about the situation in Bakhmud. Over the last uh, weeks and months, we have seen fierce fighting in and around uh, Bakhmud. And uh, what we see is that uh, Russia is throwing in uh, more troops, uh, more forces. And uh, what uh, Russia lacks in uh, quality, they try to make up in quantity. Uh, they have suffered uh, big losses, but at the same time, uh, we can uh, not rule out that uh, uh, <coughs> Bakhmud uh, may eventually fall um, in the coming uh, days. And therefore, uh, it is also important to highlight that uh, this does uh, 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 not uh, necessarily uh, reflect any uh, turning point of the uh, war. A very sad looking Stoltenberg, but uh, not necessarily a turning point in the war. That suggests that he absolutely understands it could be or possibly is well, a turning point well, in the war. Well, there's no question it is a turning point in the war. Uh, I'm going to say a big thank you to the person who pointed that clip out to me. And the key bit is not only does he look extremely tired and very concerned, it is the stuttering and uh, I'm going to suggest to our audience, having talked to uh, psychologists about this sort of thing, that he's got a problem because what he is saying, he doesn't actually believe. And uh, the stuttering is the result of the cognitive dissonance in his mind. But of course, NATO, uh, the West, the UK, the British Ministry of Defence have lied and lied again about the Bakhmud situation. And now the brutal reality is coming home. And of course, Russia, far from lacking munitions, is producing it on a scale that the West collectively can't match. But of course, the latest distraction is the loss of a US Reaper over the Black Sea. Let's have a look at this uh, tremendous CNN report. Now to our breaking news, a Russian jet has forced down a U.S. drone over the Black Sea after damaging its propeller. CNN's Oren Lieberman is at the Pentagon gathering details on this. Oren, tell us what we're learning about this. 
Brianna, this played out early this morning over international waters of the Black Sea, according to U.S. Air Force Europe. An MQ-9 Reaper drone, a U.S. Air Force surveillance drone or spy drone, was flying over the Black Sea when, according to the Air Force, two Russian fighter jets conducted what they're calling an unsafe and unprofessional interception. That's just the beginning of it. According to the Air Force, the two Russian Su-27 flanker fighter jets repeatedly flew in front of the MQ-9 Reaper drone, apparently in an attempt to disrupt or disturb its flight path pattern, even dumping fuel in front of that U.S. Reaper drone. And then, according to the Air Force, one of those uh, Su-27 fighter jets damaged the propeller of the Reaper drone, forcing it down. The propeller on a Reaper is behind it, so somehow that Russian fighter jet managed to damage the propeller, forcing the U.S. to bring down the drone in international waters. Of course, this is a very severe incident, and U.S. Air Force Europe issued a statement essentially, look, uh, essentially referencing how severely they view this. Let me read you a part of this. This incident demonstrates a lack of competence in addition to being unsafe and unprofessional. These aggressive actions by Russian aircrew are dangerous and could lead to miscalculation and unintended escalation. According to the National Security Council, President Joe Biden was briefed on the incident earlier this morning by National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan. So he was given that information about how this played out earlier today. According to the NSC, there have been other interceptions uh, between Russian and U.S. aircraft, but none as, as severe or as potentially escalatory as this, where we see an actual collision in midair between a Russian fighter jet and a U.S. drone that forced down the U.S. drone. Of course, the key question now, Brianna, how does the U.S. respond? How severely do they view this and how deliberately do they view this? Certainly the statement from U.S. Air Force seems to say that the Russians were very deliberate in flying in front of the drone, dumping fuel in front of the drone, and then damaging the propeller, forcing it down eventually in the Black Sea. So now we'll wait to see how the U.S. chooses to respond to this incident. We have also reached out to the Russian Ministry of Defense for comment. Brianna. Uh, well, Mike, you've got some flying experience. What are your thoughts? Incompetence? It's, it's absolutely not incompetent. It's extremely competent flying, very professional flying. If they were able to t bring that drone down, uh, CNN a alleging a collision without damaging their own aircraft, I think they've done a very capable job. I, I, th I think uh, the Americans are very worried about this. Let's just talk about the... Uh... Oh, David, you've had a smile on your face. I'm not sure whether you want to comment on that or not. Well, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm just letting this kind of flow over me, right? Because I'm, I'm confused, Brian, uh, about how all of this can be happening. Because we've got Russian artillery, um, uh, bunker busting bombs, um, we've got fighters, um, but the BBC are telling me uh, that the <laughs> Russian reservists are fighting with shovels, hand to hand, because they don't have any ammunition, and they're quoting. Um, the um, British Ministry of Defence as, uh, as their source, uh, Russian reservists could be using shovels for hand-to-hand -hand, uh, combat. So this seems, shall we say, um, not to be consistent with the other facts that you have presented. With the reality, uh, there was a really excellent meme which I decided not to use, but it was showing the downing of the American Reaper, uh, Reaper by the Russian pilot reaching out of his cockpit with a shovel in order to destroy the, in order to destroy the propeller, okay. but uh, just uh, a few facts about what's really going on here. Of course, what this is is the Americans conducting the war. Um, okay, they've got the drone over international waters, but its job is to help conduct and prosecute the war in Ukraine and kill Russian soldiers. Uh, these are very expensive pieces of kit here. So just a, a few little facts from this particular article. It says of March 2021, the U.S. Air Force has stated that the unit cost of a Reaper uh, is 26.5 million. 56. Sorry, sorry, 56.5 million. But that is a package that includes four aircraft with sensors, ground control station and a satellite link. And then this one here says in April 20. 2021, the US uh, Defence Department quoted the Australian government an estimated figure of 1.651 billion when they inquired about buying 12 Reapers. So the suggestion is the Americans are probably feeling a little bit sad at the moment that their, their toy aircraft has dropped. And I did enjoy the comment of, um, of people under the CNN uh, video because a lot of them were paying their respects to the families of the of the downed Reaper pilot. 
Uh, you might need to think about that one, but I, I found it amusing. Uh, here's the BBC, US drone crash, a fraught moment with danger. Uh, could it have been an accident based on the actions of the Russian pilots? It's clear it was unsafe, unprofessional. They also broke uh, environmental laws by dumping fuel into the Black Sea. This is probably going to change the whole of the local environment. I think the actions speak for themselves. Um, and uh, we've got the key bit here. It's not just Western weaponry that's helping Ukraine to withstand Russia's invasion. It's also a vast quantity of real-time intelligence on every part of Russia's military operation, including the movement of vessels in the Black Sea and the launch of missiles aimed at targets across Ukraine. From defending Ukraine's critical national infrastructure to planning its own offensive operations, Kiev depends heavily on the steady flow of information and what it should say is on the steady flow of information from sources such as these Reaper, dro uh, Reaper drones. Um, now, are we having an impact? Well, a, a viewer of UK column pointed out a little exchange um, in tweets from Latvia. Um, so what was happening was the, Ki the Kiev Independent was reporting defence intelligence information from UK. That was essentially misinformation claiming Russian ammunition shortages, whereas in reality the Russians have increased their shells per day to a minimum of 20,000, and Ukraine can only manage about 25% of this. But what was of interest that the viewer picked up is that uh, in a response to this tweet in Latvian, the UK column got a mention, and the professional interpreter said, I interpret this Latvian tweeter responding to the other Latvian tweeter and saying that the um, Defence Intelligence Service is wrong and that UK column is right, which I thought was very interesting. Now, just to uh, provide a little bit of a pathway to your section, Mike, um, a big thank you again to a viewer who pointed out this intriguing little exchange from back on the, I think it was the 20, 25th of February, 2022, between Boris Johnson and our very own additional Minister for War, Tobias Elwood. Let's have a look at the mental acumen of the players in this debate. If you're saying, uh, Mr. Elwood, that you think we should um, uh, go back and, uh, and prepare for tank battles, in, uh, no, you're putting words into my mouth. I, I don't know what, what I, but, you, but you're saying that it, uh, well, you, you mentioned. But you uh, mentioned tanks. On the European we border. are cutting back in our and, tanks. What is announcing I, on the Russian border, right now on the Ukrainian border? It's tanks, arguably. Yes. Enough. Well, but that's besides the point. I'm saying step yeah. back, look at the wider security but, picture, uh, if you look think, at our defence posture, and see what needs to be done. If you think that UK tanks are the answer? Then, no, no, no. Then, now you're, you're going saying, down an avenue. I'm commit saying UK tanks to the defence of Ukraine. No, 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 no. You deliberately. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. You're taking us down this rabbit hole because you know perfectly well it's not about I'm not, I'm tanks. Not taking you down the rabbit tanks hole. are one element of a wide spectrum You're, of our defence capability. You brought up tanks, Mr. Elton. Tanks. You brought up aircraft. Tanks. 48 I, aircraft, I, F-35s. You promised 138. You've cut back to 48. You cut back on not just tanks. Warriors have been removed completely. Hercules aircraft removed completely. And then 10,000 troops have been removed. So we can talk about tanks, we, or we can we, talk about the wider spectrum of capabilities that have been reduced. To. At the very time, I'm trying to make clear that there are bigger threats coming over the horizon. Yes, Prime Minister. And, and I, I think what I'm trying to make clear is I think that uh, it's now or never uh, for the UK armed forces. Uh, we have to recognise that the, now old, or never. the old concepts of, uh, of fighting big tank battles on, uh, in, in, on the European landmass, which I, I, I think is what you're driving at, uh, is, uh, are, are over, and there are, there are other uh, better things that we should be investing in uh, in the FCAS, in the Future Combat Air System, uh, in in cyber. Uh, this is how this is how warfare of the future is is going to be you know, be fought in our advanced early warning systems, uh, and uh, that is where we need uh, to be. Well, so what Boris there is uh, re restating is the contents of the 2021. Uh, integrated Defence Review uh, and uh, the, the the position of the senior military in the UK at the time that uh, the what needed to happen was that the old uh, metal uh, 
uh, armaments, arms and armaments that we had like tanks in the past, these all needed to be sunsetted in replacement with uh, weapons in space so uh, and cyber warfare and hybrid warfare and information warfare and so on. And this is uh, pretty much uh, followed through to the integrated review refresh 2023 that we talked about on Monday's program. So here is the actual document. Uh, responding to a more contested and volatile world. Now, there's a paradox in this because they're very much, if you, as we go through the language here, you see they're very much saying that the world is a much more dangerous place. We're much more likely to end up in some kind of hot war. But don't worry about that. We're not going to invest in more tanks, planes, and ships. We're going to continue to invest in cyber and so on. Uh, so uh, IR 2021 uh, identified four trends that would shape the international environment to 2030, shifts in the distribution of global power, interstate systemic competition over the nature of international order, rapid technological change and worsening transnational challenges. Our assessment is that these remain trends that will dominate the decade ahead, so nothing changes there. However, the government's decision to publish the IR refresh, which is this document, reflects the pace at which these trends have accelerated over the past two years. In that time, a transition to a multipolar, fragmented and contested world has happened more quickly and definitively than, than anticipated. We are now in a period of heightened risk and volatility uh, that is likely to last beyond the 2030s. And they produced a nice little video clip. Let's have a, a look at it, telling, me, telling us all that we're in an increasingly contested world, that they're adapting the UK's role, that the UK active, uh, actively participates in defensive openness, freedom, and the rule of, rule of law. Uh, but they've got a tank on it. But we're, shut, we're, we're, just, we're not renewing our tank fleet and so on. Uh, and, uh, and so it goes. But we've got to prevent Russia benefiting from its invasion of Ukraine. Uh, and uh, we've got to align with our allies and protect our interests and so on. Uh, and, but we've got a nuclear symbol here because we've got to secure our place on the cutting edge of, of uh, science and technology and so on. So anyway, uh, what was uh, really announced was a five, as we mentioned on Monday, a five billion pound uh, increase in defense spending, two billion to replenish and boost our munitions stockpiles. These are all of the stuff that we've sent to Ukraine that's been used already that it, we don't have the capability to replace in a hurry. So we're going to spend some money to do that. And then the rest to support the nuclear enterprise through infrastructure, skills, training and AUKUS. We'll come on to AUKUS again in a second. So let's just have a look at some of the things uh, that they're talking about. This uh, extra five billion follows a 24 billion pound four year cash uplift in defense spending, the largest sustained increase since the Cold War, they claim. Uh, they say we will review defense spending after 25, after 2025 in light of our ambition to increase defense spending to two and a half percent of GDP in the longer term. Uh, we will set up a new integrated security fund worth one billion pounds to deliver on the core objectives of the integrated review at home and around the world, this replaces the existing conflict, stability and security fund. Now, I have always argued that the comma in that is in the wrong place because the money that the Foreign Office has spent through the CSSF has been there to sustain and to make stable and secure the conflict in various areas of the world. It's not there to, to deal with conflict, it's there to create conflict and make sure that conflict runs on nice and stably because that allows us to do all kinds of things. But anyway, CSSF being replaced with new, this new integrated security fund. Vanessa will have more to say about that on Friday. Uh, we will provide an additional 20 million pounds in funding to the BBC World Service, ensuring it can to con continue to provide 42 vital language services, including in countries, quotes, targeted by hostile states for disinformation. Well, so, I, I hope people from Eastern Europe listening to our broadcast today understand what, what they're being told there, that the BBC, yes, is a state weapon that will be used against them. And of course, we've talked about BBC Media Action working to set up Suspilny, the Ukrainian uh, TV station. So um, be under no illusions that when you're looking at the BBC, particularly in Eastern Europe, this is... Uh, the, uh, what is it, the iron fist in a velvet glove. This is soft power of the UK government. Okay, and a very large part of the new review is a reorientation of our posture with respect to China. So they've got a huge section on China. China under the Chinese Communist Party, they say, poses an epoch-defining and systemic challenge with implications for almost every area of government policy and the everyday lives of British people. Uh, in responding to this challenge, the UK will strengthen our national security protections, align and cooperate with our partners and engage where it 
uh, it is consistent with their interests. And that, of course, is what AUKUS is all about, which we'll come on to in a second. But just before we get on to AUKUS, I just wanted to mention that the uh, US has also published their 2024 uh, defense budget, and the themes are quite similar. So if we just highlight this, for example, as the uh, People's Republic of China races to modernize its military, this budget will sh sharpen our edge by making critical investments across all time frames, theaters, and domains. So again, very similar to the integrated review, they're talking about uh, hybrid warfare effectively amongst numerous important actions that bolster our com combat capable, uh, credibility in the short term. This budget makes the department's largest ever investments in readiness and procurement because they've got to replace all the uh, uh, arms and armaments that they've sent over to Ukraine already. Uh, uh, they, to sustain our military advantage over China, it, takes, it makes major investments in the integrated air and missile defenses. Uh, this budget includes the largest ever Pacific deterrence initiative, uh, which we are using to invest in advanced capabilities, new operational concepts, and more resilient force posture in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, so they're absolutely uh, pushing against China, uh, we are joining that game. So AUKUS, uh, a part of this, here is the latest graphic from the Ministry of Defence, because of course they announced the submarine deal. Uh, and uh, let's have a look at what they're saying about it. This is an historical trilateral partnership, uh, a new fleet of submarines for the UK and Australia, uh, UK world leading design, uh, let's see, cutting edge US submarine technology, uh, and UK submarines built by BAE Systems and Rolls-Royce. But of course, uh, the Australian ones are not going to be. So uh, what they're saying is that uh, uh, commencing in the early 2030s, subject to approval from the Congre for US Congress, the United States will sell three Virginia-class submarines to Australia uh, with the option to sell two additional submarines if de deemed necessary. Uh, that is uh, a crucial, apparently, to enable Australia to to sort of get through the next number of years until these new submarines are built, because the new submarines are going to be uh, only uh, coming online sometime in the 2030s and 2040s. So the uh, Virginia-class submarines uh, will go to Australia to fill that gap. And in the meantime, also, uh, the UK will base one of its astute submarines in Australia as well. Um, so we're all getting involved in making sure that uh, the pressure being kept on China. Well, we, we hope, hope the design and build is uh, better than for the aircraft carriers, because, of course, we know we've still got major problems and can't keep both the carriers at sea. But more on that another time. Indeed. Uh, very briefly, uh, if you like what the UK Column does, you'd like to support us, uh, please head over to community.ukcolumn.org. Options to help us there, or you can pick something up at the UK Column shop. But please do share material you find on the various platforms. OK, and a reminder again that tickets for AV13, that's the 22nd of October 2023, a day in the Leonardo Hotel Milton Keynes. Those tickets are going quite quickly. So if you're thinking of attending, uh, please get online and uh, book your ticket. Uh, plus a reminder that uh, an AV online will be taking place the 22nd of April. Um, please do join us for that. Can I just mention, Brian, that uh, although we're supporting the Alternative View conferences, we're not uh, running them. So uh, if you've got questions about tickets or anything like that, you need to contact the AV team themselves uh, because we aren't in a position to really assist other than perhaps to forward on an email. But it'd be much easier if you just uh, contact them directly. OK, thank you for that. And uh, Debbie, I, I, you've got a thank you um, slide here, which I think is a very important one. I have indeed. Um, I had a lovely message from Charlotte um, and she said, please, would I thank all our UK column um, audience, viewers and listeners who have contributed to this uh, GoFundMe page. I mean, it's just been phenomenal. And also Charlotte, and this is the message that I'm reading out from, from her with her grateful thanks to everyone. She says, we've made a public Facebook page for uninjured people who support us so we can keep them up to date on our campaign, sharing information and ways in which people can help support us. If you have Facebook, could you like it and write a review on there about your experience of helping us? So big, huge thank you um, from UKCV family. And just to let everybody know, we are keeping because the vaccine injured are feeling as though they have many, many um, broadcasters and mainstream media, any that mainstream media like GB News that were featuring and, and lo looking at vaccine injured stories 
don't seem to be, but we will keep our eyes on that. And also stories to keep an eye on on the website as well. And um, I'm jumping into big shoes here with Alex because Alex asked me um, if I would please give a mention out for all the stories that we're watching. And these two in particular, the German health minister in substantial reversal on vaccine injuries and the Austrian story leaked documents showing vaccine conspiracy in Austria. And Alex has also been telling us about all of the articles, the new articles, the new podcasts, the new videos that are going up on the website all the time. And these are just two examples. If you haven't got time to watch something and you just want to listen, then um, Alex has got Eastern Approaches podcast and there's a Mark Anderson on the WHO uh, podcast. So please do um, have an explore. And also just a quick shout out for my blog, this week I'm looking at living wills and pointing people in direction, signposting them to where you may be able to get more information. And also Canary in the coal mine, where are the yellow cards going? And did you know that there was a whole new community arising like a phoenix from the ashes at Canary Wharf, the Europe's largest wet lab and loads of accommodation for thousands and thousands of scientists. So just keep an eye on that. And then um, thank you so much to Peter Todd, a consultant and in his, in his very own words, he's a maverick, a vaccine injury expert who was brought to us by Alex uh, Kelly, who has now started a most amazing trust in memory of her mum. And for one pound a month, you can support this where the money will go to like a private legal aid um, fund for people that are seeking help from Peter, whether it be with regards to vaccine injury or vaccine bereavement. And just for as, as little as a pound a month contribution, this will go towards paying any legal costs. But Peter does do an awful lot of work for free. So huge thanks. And please have a look at that interview. It's up on the front page of the website. Debbie, thank you very much for that. And we say to our audience, um, we're working very, very hard to increase the uh, the content of UK column and to broaden out the uh, type of articles, videos and uh, podcasts that we're producing. We hope you're noticing that. And we've only been able to do this with your uh, support over the last few years, which has been utterly tremendous. So if you're a UK columns viewer and you're liking what you're seeing, because we are clearly working to expand, just remember we've only been able to do it with the people that have been kind enough to donate to UK Column or take out a, a membership uh, to help fund us. And we are going to grow, that's our ambition. And we're doing it because we really value the support that we've had uh, from our viewers, not only in the UK, but across the world. And it's really astonishing now, the number of countries that are starting to watch UK uh, Column. And lastly, I want to end, uh, in my mind, I still have the picture of the female Ukrainian soldier that the British Ministry of Defence so cruelly used in order to try and help recruiting in Ukraine. I can still see that light, that lady crying as she stumbled over the words. So if you're listening to us from Eastern Europe or indeed in Ukraine, uh, we feel for you and we're gonna do our very best to report what we can to get this appalling war stopped. So we'll end there. Thank you very much for joining UK Column. Uh, it, we will have extra time in a few minutes and we've got a pretty packed uh, remainder of the news to cover. So if you can join us then, thank you.